All right, thank you all so much for being here tonight for the Winooski Ave Transportation Study. My name is Chapin Spencer, Director of Public Works, and great to see uh, so many folks on a cold night tonight to enjoy a, uh, a warm room tonight to talk about the Winooski Ave Corridor. Um, pleased to have everybody here. Thanks for the city councilors who are here tonight. Uh, thank you to uh, staff and the Regional Planning Commission who has worked on this project from its inception and our consultants tonight, Resource Systems Group and Third Sector Associates. This project started about last summer uh, and has progressed uh, to this point tonight where we're going to talk about uh, recommendations. And uh, I want to say that we've set this format up to have an efficient overview of the recommendations tonight provided by the consulting team. And then there will be some questions uh, from the floor as a large group. And then we're going to want to break out into small groups where there will be opportunities to provide comments around the room. So with that, I'm going to invite up John Slayson from Resource Systems Group to provide uh, an overview of the project. Yes, there will be Q&A after the presentation. Yes. Yes, there will be an opportunity for questions after the presentation, absolutely. All right, thank you, uh, Chapin. So thank you, everybody. Uh, this, this heat is here disturbing my pieces of paper here. But uh, So I'm Jonathan Slayson, and I'm here with uh, Resource Systems Group. And as Chapin mentioned, we're uh, part of a team here with Du Bois and King. They were the other consultant team that was left off with also street plans. Mike Lyden uh, from New York City and, and his team, they've been advising us with some, some interesting ideas and helping us evaluate these, these options. So tonight, I'm going to go through an introduction of why we're here tonight, introduction of some of the challenges that we're experiencing in this corridor and why this project has come to be. And then we want to introduce I want to verbally go through the options that are shown in the boards to the left and, and to, or to my right and to my left, as well as uh, we have a 3D model as well. And the idea is that we have a lot of people here. And to chairman's uh, about the public forum, I think we need to balance how much time do we have for a conversation during this. This format of this meeting is set up that we're, select, that we're uh, soliciting comments via verbal as well as written at these stations and the project team will be manning these stations at the end of this presentation so we'll be receiving as many comments as possible but during this presentation I'll be inviting you to ask questions throughout and if you have clarification questions as to what what I'm communicating and, and what the options mean for us so we're here um, on the on the Winooski Avenue transportation um, study and this has been an 18 month uh, project or so so far and we're hoping to, to wrap up in the early part of next year. So what is this study? This study is a, is a comprehensive transportation study of the entire Winooski Avenue corridor from Riverside down to Howard. And then it's aimed at developing a multimodal improvement strategy to address safety, capacity and connectivity. And the final deliverable will mean an actionable, implementable plan with near-term and longer-term recommendations. And we know that some of the recommendations here are challenging, and that is, that is part of any study. And we have some, uh, some recommendations for how we can move ahead later on in this presentation. So why are we here? We realize that this is a heavily used corridor. It's a diverse corridor. Diverse land uses, diverse users, it's a comprehensive corridor study it has not yet been conducted. Even though we've been studying this corridor from 2000 onwards to various, uh, various ways. We realize it's a gateway to the city, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way. It's a multimodal facility that's inconsistent and not intuitive for all users. We realize that seven out of the 20 priority intersections in the plan BTV walk bike study are along the Winooski Avenue corridor study. 16% of bicycle crashes and 17% of pedestrian crashes in the city in the last five years have occurred along the corridor. And then VTrans has identified several high crash locations along the corridor. Earlier plans have identified other opportunities from the reconnections of St. Paul and Pine Street. And we realized that that would have opportunities for further changes on, on Winooski. 
And then lastly, we know that the, one of the larger studies that has been completed by the city, the plan BTV walk bike has identified that this, pro that this corridor be improved with some uh, bicycle facilities, some protected bicycle facilities. But we realize through the course of this evaluation and the initial phases of this study is that there's been no holistic corridor-wide appreciation of how to integrate all of these plans and challenges that have been identified. So the initial parts of the project is to identify a vision. Where, where do we want to go as a community? And I'll introduce the PAC, uh, the Project Advisory Committee, in a, in a little bit. But the Project Advisory Committee worked on identifying what are the aspects of what would be a vision for this corridor that the city would accept. And so these are the bullet points that we've identified, is that traveling along and across Winooski Avenue will be safe, inviting, and convenient for people of all ages and abilities using any mode. Walking and bicycling will be viable and enjoyable ways, and improvements will encourage active travel within the city. Businesses will flourish and remain flourishing with an activated streetscape and convenient access along and near to the corridor. And we realize that mobility meaning through mobility, as well as local access and parking needs will be balanced for both property owners, residents, and businesses, and the greater transportation system in Burlington. And we realize that the street has to adapt. We realize that when we move curbs and we move uh, significant infrastructure, we're less able to respond to the transportation systems. And so we need to develop a policy and a system that would allow us to be flexible for the future. So just a brief introduction to the study process and where we are to date is that we had an existing conditions meeting uh, on September 5th of 2018. And then we went through a public meeting number two and here we are in public meeting number three. And then over the course of that, we've engaged with the project advisory committee and we've had six meetings to date. And I think just it would be really helpful for me and I think for everybody here just to, um, I, I want to appreciate the effort that the PAC has put in. And I think for past and current members of the PAC, would you just please raise your hand? Yeah, thank you, thank you uh, for because <laughs> uh, the, the PAC is is uh, an important role within this project. Is that they're a, they're a representative group that's meant to engage with the with the local residents and the businesses and the community at large while providing their opinion and expertise. And so they've they've devoted a significant amount of time to this project. And so the next steps from here is that we're going to solicit all, as much comment and feedback today. This is, this is a big meeting, and that's what, obviously, from the number of people that are here today, you understand that, is that we want to get your feedback. And that's going to be taken by the project team and the project advisory committee and incorporate a recommendation for next steps. And that's going to inform this implementation plan as well as the draft report that will be then tabled to the PAC and then onto the city council. So this will be the, the last time that I think we'll gather in this forum, forum but, uh, but your comments here will be in, instrumental in informing the next steps of the project. And then obviously at the city council uh, meetings, there'll be room for additional public, public comment. So the schedule from here is that uh, I think this might, might, uh, might adapt a little bit based on the amount of comments and the feedback that we get tonight. But we're here in the third public meeting, and then we do show the fourth public meeting occurring at the city council meeting when we would go to the draft report and, and discuss the implementation plan uh, that we've anticipated. And then we would end up sometime completing in the early part of next year. So how did we get here? I mentioned that we've studied the corridor since early 2000s uh, a number of different ways. And a lot of that has been traffic and car mobility in the early part of the years, and then later it's been focused on multimodal and appreciating that there's a diverse set of needs and users that need to be accommodated within this, within this corridor. Now, so I spoke last time we met in this forum, and I don't want to go through at length of, of some of the challenges, and I think I already just articulated some of the safety challenges that we have. But this corridor has, has a lot of traffic volume. It has a high degree of parking demand. It has a lot of uh, safety challenges that we have. And therefore, we needed to bring this, this, this project up. So I'm not going to go through a lot of what, what the existing challenge is. I think a lot of them are obvious. And we have reports on the website. And we have other previous documentation that's available that could walk you through all of the existing conditions. And so where I pick up is, is where we left off last time we were in this room. And we had some charts uh, over there that I think was causing some confusion and apologize for that. 
But we came up the pack, the project advisory committee and the project team came up with 13 variations of improving this corridor. Now, when I, I've been involved in corridor studies for the last 15 years, and it's very uh, seldom do you see that extensive analysis of 13 variations. Now, generally, they aligned under three different headers, if you will. So we had alternative one, and alternative two, and alternative three. And then there were sub-variations of those alternatives. Just to quickly to introduce those, and this is what we, where we left off last time we met as a public meeting, is that we had alternative one. And that to generally characterize these alternatives is alternative one basically had bicycle facilities, unprotected uh, traditional bike lanes along the corridor. And then there were variations which widened the corridor to uh, maintain certain a number of parking spaces. Uh, we have some widening here. We have some options that keeps the existing curb line here. We have some existing options that keep the curb line but change the roadway uh, paint. So I don't want to go in length, but that's generally where we were. We had 13 variations and different cross sections that we were analyzing. And apologies, I've got a little sniffles here. Um, alternative two is that this option widened the road and also had protected bicycle facilities, and that's generally what characterized alternative two. And lastly, we had alternative three, which generally can characterize as the two-way cycle facility along the east side of the road. And that's what is shown in this kind of double green line here. And so these were schematics. They didn't go in detail in terms of the width of the corridor. They identified general impacts uh, that, that could be quantified. And we realized that now the, the, the details matter. And that's why we're here today. Uh, but first, I thought I would uh, kind of uh, go here quickly as to what we heard. So we did go through an extensive engagement process. We've met, and particularly Brian Davis from the RPC, but also Nicole Loesch from the, from the Public Works. They've engaged with over 20 different distinct groups and organizations along the corridor, as well as then other interested parties. And generally, what we can summarize what we've heard is that there is, a, there is a significant interest in continuous dedicated bicycle lanes, and they're critical if we're going to change the mode shift that the city is looking to, to um, realize and get more people on, bike, on bikes. We also heard that street trees and the green strip is critical for, for an inviting corridor, for a streetscape, let alone the environmental benefits. And we realized that the main to Pearl corridor, the downtown corridor, which we're calling here, has a particular issue is that we do see the highest number of safety issues arise there. But I think the by and large, the comments are overwhelming that there are, uh, these are some of the, the adjectives that people have described the, the main to Pearl as aggressive, stressful, dangerous, and unattractive. And then lastly, we do know that there's a high demand of parking, and particularly in the North Winooski corridor section. And so we have some specific actions that we'll discuss uh, for, for that segment of the corridor. So where are, where, where are we going? Is that we have 13 variations of this project. We identified evaluation criteria. And last time we met, we had a board up here that said, what do you think about the, these evaluation criteria? And overwhelmingly, people identified that they, that they valued those criteria, that they were appropriate to use. And then through that process, we analyzed the 13 variations, and we resulted in some near and long-term options for the corridor. The final evaluation criteria that were used were these ones that I have in back of me. Some of them used calculated metrics. Some of them were used engineering judgment. And what resulted was that we could come up with, then they kind of went through a filter of understanding how practical came out of that analysis process. How could they be balanced and consistent along the corridor? We didn't want to have uh, a two-way cycle facility on one block and then the immediate block a regular bike lane. And so those consistencies were something that we were, um, we were looking at through this process. And then we came up with the options. Now, this chart here, I'm happy to take questions uh, later on after this presentation, but to just to walk you through this quickly is that it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a heat chart, is that the red is typically poor or bad, and the green is good. We can't read that away. Yeah. This will be available on the, on the website, and I will, have, I will have my handout here on a table if anybody's curious for some of the more detail. But just to walk you through quickly is that 
um, street trees, for instance. This particular option, this 2B, had this red option. This one impacted the street trees more significantly than other options. Uh, we realized that for transit, the two-way bicycle facility on the east side of the road, within our narrow right-of-way, we had a very difficult time to accommodate adequate, safe unloading and loading access for transit. So those options were, were weighted uh, as poor for transit. And then also pedestrian and parking changes. You can see uh, the change in the green strip width and cost. So some of the options that widen the road, that move the curb line, those have a darker color associated with them. Sure, sure, sorry. Yes, I apologize if you can't read that. So we have bicycle level of stress, and this is a, fun, this is a metric that we, that we covered in previous meetings. I don't know what happened there. The computer's still on. Oh my, we don't have an IT support. <laughs> so the power looks to be off. Is it back there? All right. <laughs> All right, Corey. Um, do you want me to read those titles? Is it helpful just to read them through right now? All right. That's right. They are the criteria metrics that were on the previous slide there. So we have bicycle level of stress. That's a metric that's a nationally identified metric to identify how a bicycle perceives the environment, bicyclist. Then there is a pedestrian quality of service. Then there's the number of parking spaces changed or, or altered in the alternative. There's the number of street trees impacted. Then there is the change in the green strip width. There is the cost. And then there's a neighborhood access metric, which is changing of, do you change two directional vehicle lanes or are you only in one lane vehicle lanes? And then there's a vehicle operations and safety metric, which is all about uh, whether the vehicles are slowed or, or, or hastened on, uh, on their operations. And then lastly, there's a transit metric, and that is how transit would be served in the alternative. I did notice that the power looked to be off on the, on the projector itself. It has a red mark. Can I press the? <laughs> All right. Then I, I'm happy to go through, and it will be, uh, we can continue. Um, but do you think I should press the power button on there? I'd be curious whether that's just it. All right. Oh, so do you think, like, the voltage or something? <laughs> All right. Let's, let's see what we can do here quickly. See, it's blinking green now. Let's see whether what happens. And I do have our projector in the car. That's uh, if that's lamp replace. Oh boy. So, Corey, do you want to go get my projector, or do we want to just continue on? Because all right, because we do all the graphics that we have here are on these boards. So uh, thank you, everybody. Bear with us. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, can we do that? Hey, Corey, can you grab uh, an, an easel, too? Oh, did it come on as well? OK, great. Yeah. OK, all right, we'll, we'll get into this. All right. So if we can't see these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this a little quicker, because we want to get into the, the meat of this. Um, we walked through this. Then we have intersections as well. There was a separate set of criteria here. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but generally they talked about some of the same criteria, whether it, right of way of impact, safety, operations, how they accommodate bicycle and pedestrians, how they accommodate cars, how they accommodate parking and transit. 
and we have identified how intersections would be configured in this corridor. By and large, we're going to suggest keeping the intersections largely intact as they are. And there's some reasons for that is that there's some significant projects on the horizon, particularly for Main Street. And then we also have some opportunities to put in some mini roundabouts in the northern part of the corridor. And we expect to, pro uh, to pilot those or test those out to see how they perform. In the downtown area, we found that the traffic signals I think are, are the most reasonable for the limited right of way that we have and they, they checked out to be um, adequate in terms of our criteria here. So if we look at all the intersections you'll see there is not a lot of changes out the, uh, on the corridor at an intersection level. So here we are, uh, the, the corridor options. We're going to walk through what we have identified as, as a shorter term option. And the reason why it's a shorter term option is that it's a balance, is that first and foremost, it improves safety and convenience for all users. It reallocates road space between Main Street and Pearl Street, and that's shown in all of the different options that we have. And then it shortens some of the intersection crossings and calms traffic at intersections. Namely, at Main Street, we have an opportunity to remove some of the right-hand turn lanes there. It creates a connected, contiguous north-south bicycle facility. It retains the existing parking on the west side of the corridor. And it does improve access for residents and businesses, making it two-way north of North Street in this shorter term option. These are the intersection options that we showed. Uh, basically, we say on Main Street, we can improve the intersection a little bit. Uh, we show that maybe that Union and North Street, there's an opportunity for a mini roundabout there. It should be tested and piloted, but generally everything that we've suggested um, aligns with what's there today with some enhancements for safety. So this is a graphic that is shown on these charts here on the left and the right of the room. So Riverside to North Street. The short-term proposal is that we do remove the east side parking to accommodate the multimodal facilities of improved bicycle facility along the whole corridor and that we would retain the west side parking. And the reason for that is that there's fewer parking spaces on the east side, there's more curb cuts on the east side, more driveways. There are opportunities for stormwater improvements, pedestrian improvements at intersections. And then we do improve the connectivity by making it two-way vehicle from North Street north. Now, we realize that the impacts are significant uh, on the parking and the people who utilize the parking in that section of the, of the road. And we know that it's highly utilized. This is a balanced option that has come through an evaluation process. Not every evaluation process, it, you, you balance cost, parking, street trees, right of way, everything gets balanced and this is the outcome. We realize, and so our proposal is that a parking management plan will be conducted prior to any changes along this section of the corridor. And that is our recommendation from the project team, and I believe the city ha has, has agreed that that is a uh, critical action that would be undertaken. Now, this is the opportunity, if we want to do some comments, we have an option is that I think there's a lot more fruit in some comments that we can make afterwards, but if you have a comment that you want to make or a question that you want to make now, please raise your hand, and I'm going to um, try to control a little bit on time. We want to get through these slides, so to give everybody a, a, a summary of what we, were, what, we, what we found, and I want to respect everyone's time, so I want to, if we get too far off a line, I'm going to respectfully ask that, uh, that I get back the floor. So, Stu, you were first. So, uh, I'm going to add a company. metrics and everything, but is there a report that shows that, number one, all of it? Number two, what it really comes down to here, honestly, I mean, I've been living in the old North End for 35 years. I remember where there were no trees, no green belt, nothing. We've made great progress. But what it comes down to, and I, I honestly, respectfully say, don't waste our time, it comes down to biking and parking. That's it. Most people in this room, that's what they care about. And I would like this conversation be focused on that. My name is Jason Van Dreisch. Um, when I started with Local Motion in 2009, Winooski Ave was the number one thing that anybody who biked or who wanted to bike and was too afraid to do so brought up as their top priority. When I left Local Motion in 2018, nine years later, same thing. 
This alternative that's put forth here is practical, it's fair, it's implementable. It should have been done years ago. It's clear that there's many complications that meant that we're dealing with it now. But this is the right plan and it's the time and it needs to happen and I'm so excited to be here tonight and see this moving forward. Uh, so I haven't kept track of who had their hands first. I want to kind of do this out of the room. You had your hand first here early on. Yeah, Brian, is it? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, from a motivated two way in that section, what was the, the main uh, motivation for that since it's pretty easy for cars to go around either street east or west of that um, rather than just retain the parking in that section? Can you repeat the question? Please? Yeah, so the question was that the, what was the, why did the two way shake out in terms of this option? And you'll see in the longer term option is that the actual widening or the two-way facility was shown to be the, the widening, excuse me, I don't want to say widening, the option for two-way vehicle traffic was actually shown to be a high uh, ranking option north of Pearl Street, period. So from Pearl all the way to Riverside would be two-way, and then that means from Main Street to Riverside would be two-way. But what, to, what that means is that we would have to widen the curb in the area north between Pearl and North Street, and that means that it's no longer in the shorter term option. And so by having the widening from North Street to Union in this case, that is achievable within the existing curb width that we have. And it was identified as one of the metrics and it was and it was uh, it came out as the higher higher ranked option. So if that answers the question. Yeah. Sure. Um, so Bicycling and walking is my main form of transportation, but unfortunately, I'm in a position where I need to own a car. I've lived on North Moosey for about 10 years in a couple of residences. Um, there are a tremendous amount of parking on that street that do not have parking. I prefer to have bike lanes, but if you're talking about taking off half the parking, that's going to hit a lot of people. I work seven at night, seven in the morning, and I park my car on the street. I have to walk. I live past the meters, so I have to walk, you know, however many blocks that I get from parking space to get home at the end of the night. Like, like it, it's. I just want to make sure that that gets looked at. <coughs> So to address kind of two of those questions uh, or comments is that the parking management plan, for those not familiar, and, and I want to get these inputs because the parking management plan is not yet established, it's not a scope of work. But the general idea of a parking management plan is that you do first a supply count. How much physical space is appropriate for a vehicle to be stored there for a length of time? And then you would be identified who are the users of that, of that space. Who's able to use it? What distance do they have to walk uh, between a house and that parking space? And so you'd be connecting that supply and that demand side. And the opportunities would be that can some parking spaces be shared between various users? And so it, it's, a, it's a complicated study. And that needs to be done because I think it's by and large, we're hearing it again tonight, uh, that there's a lot of demand and, and removing the parking is, cannot be done without a more thorough investigation. So Chapin, should we move on or I want to? I think the best help here questions if people can stand up when they Sure, and I can repeat. Um, can I clarify that? Sure. So does that mean that the parking management is for the spaces are removed? Yes, so the parking management plan would be done before parking spaces would be removed in this section of the corridor, the North Avenue to North Street. It was a method or a plan? I think the plan, I don't, want to miss, I don't want to misspeak. I am the consultant hired for the project team, and my advice would be that the plan would have a high degree of buy-in from the local, the local stakeholders. Is that a political answer? <laughs> uh, 
in the white shirt there. Can you explain to us what the connectivity problem is now that's trying to be solved by two-way traffic? Because I work on that street and I'm not seeing the connectivity problem. I've worked on the street for like 25 years. Uh, so we'll know how to get to it. The connectivity is that for local residents and businesses, you might know how to navigate the street network. So the comment was, what is the connectivity issue that we're trying to solve? And so it was identified early in the project that if you looked at the Winooski Avenue corridor as a whole, depending on which mode you travel on, you have various degrees of difficulty to get where you're going depending on where you came from along the corridor. And so there's segments here that are one way, southbound only. There's some segments that have two way for cars. There's some segments that are southbound only for bicycles. There's some segments that have no bicycles. We are very fortunate enough to have two-way pedestrian uh, uh, facilities along the whole section of the, lane, of the corridor. So the idea is that depending on, as the vision has said, we want to be a multimodal connectivity, uh, connected corridor. And so that's where that metric came from. Uh, so I'm going to maybe take two more questions, and then we'll kind of continue on. Uh, Laura first, and then. Yep. Yeah, can you just remind us why it's a priority for the city to have um, a multimodal road? I mean, I know from my perspective, I know a lot of people in this neighborhood don't own a car, so the bike lanes are important to them, but I think there are other reasons, right? It might be helpful to remind us all. Uh, that's, that's a tough question, Laura, is that, so what is the benefit of a multimodal corridor? If I could... Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if the city wants to answer that, is that I, I would have my own conjecture, but there is a whole walk-bike plan that articulates a number of benefits of a multimodal corridor. And I, I don't want to go at length there, but first and foremost, the, uh, the vision here goes back to safety and accessibility for all users. And so there are, there are benefits of connecting people where they're at and giving them the flexibility to travel because not everybody has the same means or, or ability to travel by, by every mode. Um, so I was going to go to the last comment here. Um, so yeah, just a couple things. One, in regards to parking in the city, I think we just need to look at it as well. Here we're about to remove 76 spaces from this street, but just blocks away we offer private parking, residential only for some, some people in some neighborhoods. And I really have a problem with that. We're going to remove parking from this street, but a person that lives a block away, you can't go park on their street because it's residential only. I just have a really big problem with that. And I think the other thing I think that I'd like to say tonight is it's nice to have these events and it's great to have everybody show up and we want to hear their input, but how much does it really matter? And I think the city and the mayor and the administration has to answer that question. We heard from Director Baldwin that street designs, sidewalk designs, are changing and the people of Burlington better get used to it whether they like it or not because this is the way it's going to be. So does our voice really matter and do our opinions really matter? Or are their minds made up and they're going to do it anyways? And I, don't, I do have an opinion on this project. My opinion really doesn't matter, right? But as a whole, all of us together, if we come out to an event like this, are we wasting our time? Really? Because that's the message from the city and the administration, right? They've already got an agenda. They have a plan. They're going to do it whether we like it or not. That came right from Public Works themselves. Thank you. So I would like to move on, and we can have comments after this presentation to solicit more, more feedback. And uh, to the project team, and, and, and for the purposes of any study, Comments do matter, and it is important to, to bring them up because we track all of them. It's in a, it's in a re documented, reported uh, fashion. And so any of these comments that are being spoken tonight as well as written down, we have all of them from the previous public meetings available on the Internet uh, so that everybody can look at them, and they will all be part of the appendices of this, of this large report. So I very much appreciate your input because already input has changed I think the trajectory of this study. There was no foregone conclusion that, that we walked into this with. So um, I would encourage, please maintain uh, your, your enthusiasm for the project, for or against, and tell us the challenges, but please submit your comments. Uh, so. 
they can go to the tables and there will, I think there should be the project website available. Diane has, what do you have, Diane? You're yelling. You're, yeah, there's, so there's meeting evaluation, there's sheets at the, at the front, there's these handouts that we have, there's the post-it notes, everything will be collected, photographed, and documented after this meeting. Yeah. So coming further south, quick question, process question. I would say that this is, this is not a good format again, this is not a good city council, and there are a lot of people here who are not going to get a chance to speak and say what they want to speak. All right, so uh, if you're calling bullshit on the whole process, could you suggest a better one? I mean, you guys have been like throwing the darts. Oh, yeah, she's part of the vote. She's in the bathroom. Well, the, the, the process will go into a report and to the city council. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Please, please let me. Is this a process question? Well, Not it's well. to answer his question. I do have what I see all the studies. Um, and never got another notice and I work hard so I haven't been real involved I do have one question has any you talked about bicycle accidents pedestrian accidents uh, which pretty much seems to put the blame on drivers is what I'm hearing how many studies has anybody done because I do drive places because I have a business and I have to lead funerals and do that sort of thing. How many people have ever studied how many bicyclists actually follow any of the rules? I thought from my childhood that bicycles were to follow the same rules of the road. I don't even think you'd have this problem if people on bicycles went south on my street and north on Union Street. It's one extra block to go. Right. And if they happen to stop at North mm -hmm. Winooski before turning left yeah. or before blowing the intersection of Winooski right. and Grant, have I, you done studies? I get your message, and I don't know the answer. And, I mean, I and it's think not part, of, is part wonderful, of our work But tonight. they need but to be trained and to follow rules. All right. Hey, J Jason, Jason. Hey, hey, hey. All right. You know, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say thanks, everybody. I really like the enthusiasm. We still have some good things to get through. So, so bear with me. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, to, to President Wright's question, after this presentation, there will be additional opportunity for Q and A at the end of the presentation, and then we will break up into small groups. Absolutely. So Q&A or public statements will be made in a large group, and then we will transition to the small groups. Thank you. So we'll get through the content here first. So, uh, so going further south here is that we can see a similar cross-section is the North Street to Pearl Street segment. And this is what I mentioned to, uh, to Ryan here in the front, is that um, I'll show a longer term option there in the future. But this also per, um, proposes that on the east side, the parking be removed to accommodate uh, improved facilities for other modes. And that we would retain just the southbound vehicle lane in this segment. And again, the parking management plan would have to include areas of this uh, as well. And we realize that the land use is different. So that's why these segments are, are broken up. Now, going into the downtown section. This is the Pearl Street to Main Street section. Now, I think we've seen this roadway configuration in, in, in elsewhere in the city. It's a two-way left turn lane in the middle of the road. So we would have one travel lane in each direction with the ability for people to sit in that center lane and turn left um, or to access the, the roadway from the driveway. And so it would be a reallocation of the existing curb space. And this, by and large, addresses a significant number of the challenges that have been identified in this corridor. This studied, uh, there was a previous phase of this work that identified that the traffic analysis would work here. This also works with some of the work that's happening on Bank Street, which shows down in this little graphic down here. And then we've also been working with City Market and other affected stakeholders that have a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic in this, in this corridor, that this option would work for them in terms of access for trucking and other, and other uh, facilities. 
So this option ha is proposed in all of the, the variations that was shown earlier. The 13 variations all have this option. And then this is carried into the short-term option. Now further south, we have a more limited width to work with. The right-of-way shortens or shrinks down to 58 feet or so. And the short-term option is that we maintain the two-way vehicle traffic south of Main Street today. And we would remove the east side parking spaces. Again, there's 12 metered spaces there today. And we would retain the 13 on the west side. And this way, we can continue the bicycle facilities and do some sidewalk enhancements and intersection improvements at both the Main Street and the King Street intersection. Now, what we propose south of King Street is that we would alter the vehicle lanes. From today's, it's two-way vehicle traffic on that one block north of Maple Street. That would be turned to one direction southbound. So in essence, the southbound direction would, would start now sooner or start further to the north. And what we would do there is keep the west side parking. This is the most utilized parking in, in the corridor, is that that west side parking is currently highly utilized and it will remain to be so, I expect. And so that west side parking will, will remain. And then we propose adding the bicycle facilities along that segment. And then that, this is the cross section that exists today south of Maple Street. So that cross section remains the same as today. It's shown that it's been highly successful. People have been happy with the outcome. I think the residents as well as uh, local commuters have seen that the traffic flow hasn't been affected and safety has been improved along those, that section. And so we, we propose that, that the section south of Ma Maple Street today just gets further extended north to King Street. Now, as I mentioned and alluded to, there's opportunities for some longer term options. And generally, this falls into the bucket of when we can widen curb and when money becomes more available for us to make some additional improvements. And then lastly, we need to be responsive to these other more significant projects, such as the Great Street projects. And so those are continuing on their own trajectories. And so we didn't want to interfere with those projects. So we're looking at what options would we recommend. And as I mentioned, previously is that the North Street to Pearl Street section, which in the short term remains just southbound, is that that would be widened the curb to facilitate two-way vehicle traffic. And so in essence, from Main Street all the way up to Riverside, we would have two-way vehicle traffic in this proposal, and we would maintain the west side uh, parking. And this is a long-term option. Clearly, there's the challenges of the parking that remain today. There's the idea that maybe we do additional widening to, Im to increase the number of parking spaces. There, there, there could be a myriad of other improvements here as well. But it was something that was identified out of, the, out of the 13 variations that were identified earlier. This was an option that rose uh, to the top. But we identified it in a long-term trajectory. And then the other long-term option is this lower Main Street to King Street option where we would ex now reduce the vehicle lanes to one direction. And what that would do is improve some of the efficiency at the Main Street intersection. It would then enable us to put protected bicycle facilities along this section of road uh, without widening uh, the curb. And so we put this in the long term because we would have to, uh, we would have to change the vehicle, uh, the vehicle movements more significantly. So here we are, we're gonna take some more comments, but I wanna introduce quickly some of the next steps of this project. As part of any study, you start with a vision. You go through needs and challenges, you start to identify the options and the suite of alternatives, and that's where we came up with the 13 options. We came up with the evaluation criteria that we vetted and came up and, and everybody agreed, these are the measures that we think are important. And today we're showing you the results of that process. The typical process that, out, that follows is the implementation plan. And the implementation plan identifies the challenges to get where we want to go. And we already realize that there are some significant hurdles. I think the parking is a significant one, let alone there's some other more nuanced challenges of how to accommodate some other users along the corridor. So that implementation step, the first thing that we're identifying today is that potentially these three segments can be pursued independently. 
and they can have different time horizons and different actions that the city can then take. So the idea is that we can separate the south, which would be Main Street south, and then the downtown, which would be Main Street to Pearl Street, and then we would have the north segment north of Pearl Street. And these three areas are what the boards have been identified as here and lying down here. And this is where we want to get your comments, not only on the concepts, but also the feasibility of separating it out like this. And the idea is roughly that the south segment can be pursued the soonest or on an earlier trajectory. The impacts are fewer and they're more, they're more limited to a, a few parking spaces as well as some of the, the, vehicle tr the vehicle lanes. The vehicle traffic is less significant in that corridor and it would improve the safety for all users. So we see that the South could initiate preliminary design and engineering, which is the, the, term, the technical terminology for the next step of planning. And then we would engage around, there are some parking spaces being proposed to be lost. We would engage with the local community about potentially closing the northbound traffic lane between King and Maple Street, looking at what that would, what that would do. And so that could be something undertaken or at least initiated in the next calendar year by, by the DPW. Uh, then the next segment is the downtown segment. The next segment is that there could, we could initiate the preliminary design and engineering. There needs to be some significant work on the traffic signals as well as some of the turning lanes and identify how the co corridor actually needs to look. And then we would be doing some more focused engagement with particularly high generators. We'd be looking at the parking garage along the corridor and making sure that all those, all those movements would work within that, within that idea uh, of what we proposed. And then, so that's in the more the medium time frame could be a few years out before we actually see anything because it takes some time. And then lastly is that in that later category is in that north. And so the first steps is that we have to conduct that mark parking management plan. So much to the point that, that, uh, that, we, that we heard is that the parking management plan has to be carried out with a high degree of confidence that people realize that there might be some impacts, but today that proposal of impact might be too dramatic. And how can we find some middle of the road alternatives? What options exist? Um, can we, is it management? Do we need to find some more parking supply? Whatever it might be. And so that'll be the first part that needs to be progressed. And then through that process, we'll be engaging with the community on the array of impacts. And then we also propose that might be some mini roundabouts proposed at North Street potentially or at the Union Decatur intersection. And so we could do some pilot, pilot testing of some of those proposals. So that is what we are tabling today as a potential next steps of this project and in terms of the implementation plan. Now, I believe that uh, Director Spencer has identified that we want to open up the floor for additional comments. These were some questions that I had proposed in terms of when we opened up the tables and when you're adding post-it notes. But um, I think, you know, it's 6.04. We have technically until 7 o'clock. Do we want to do something for 20 minutes, 25 minutes until 6.30? Is that, is that too long? Is that? All right, so we had a microphone uh, that was out in the audience here. Do we know where that red microphone is? There's going to be a lot of people speaking, we so have two. please two. keep your comments concise so everyone gets a chance. Great, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, concise question. Is there a way to have our cake and eat it too? <laughs> I think it's safe to say the room, most people would support both increased bike usage, bike lanes, and also protecting people's ability to have a car if the car is something that is required for their life and to have a place to park. So is there a way to do both? Let me first say that the corridor, we are constrained. This is a key gateway corridor. We have 66 feet of right of way, of public land to deal with in that northern part. It goes down to 58 feet in this southern tier. I think in the near term, there can be some quick wins. I think in the south and even the downtown, frankly, I'm convinced that those options can go without a lot of direct impact to the adjacent, um, uh, adjacent community. 
Now in the north, I think there are going to be some short-term options. How can we utilize the Union Street bike, bike facilities that are there? How can we do some near-term things to enhance the current option? So I think it's going to be suboptimal, but we can do some things to enhance what we've already done today. So that's probably the closest that we can do to getting our cake and eating it too. Otherwise, we're going to have some, we are going to have some tough decisions down the road, and we realize that we, this study has not addressed all those challenges. Um, we already have some microphones going, so I guess if you get the microphone, you get to speak. Is that what we're doing? So I'll give you the floor eventually. Uh, I, I just, I'd like to address the, uh, why you're not using the parking for separating the cars from the bicycles. It seems to me it'd be very easy to move the bicycles over to the inside of the curb with the cars out protecting the bike lanes. I, don't, I see it in one or two spots there, but I don't see it in all the way through there. I'm always in favor of separated bike lanes where the cars can't hit the bikes and using parking to protect the bicyclists. Yep. Uh, so we, we did definitely evaluate that, and it's a high benefit corridor for the bikes. But in this corridor, we have a lot of driveways, and driveways challenge that particular issue because of the safety of, of both the bicyclists along the curb and also just the visibility outside. And so I. Driveway is there anyway. You, gotta cro you have to cross the driveway. Don't tell me that there's too many driveways. Y even if you got the, the bike path on the other side, you still have to cross the bike path, but, but you still got to cross the driveway. But it's worse yep. because you got cars parked. Point, point taken. We can agree to, to disagree on that point just slightly, but I, I, we, we evaluated it, and it's definitely it's a great facility where, it, where, it, where appropriate. Uh, you with the red microphone. And I don't, I don't want to defend or, you know, there is a process that we carried out and everything has merit, but also there are cons. And, and I'm happy to go into that in, in depth where appropriate. So we can have a conversation offline. Is this on? There you okay, go. there we go. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for all the work you're putting into this um, presentation. I had a really, really specific comment about the southernmost section where there's two bike lanes. Um, I guess that's King to Howard, mm -hmm. which means that one bike lane is going against traffic. Is there an intention to put some kind of bollards or protection there? And I'm speaking specifically as a mom who bikes with her daughter that way to the public library and to school many days of the year. And I've literally had her in front of me and seen trucks coming 40 miles an hour with people texting on their phones as they approach us in that lane and you know i i'm so grateful that there's those lanes but when you watch a vehicle approaching your child at 40 miles an hour and the driver's head is down and they're clearly texting the fact that there's a bike lane painted on the ground is not enough yeah. uh, so so the, the truth is is that the width and what we're showing here does not show a buffer a, a or a bollard protected facility it might have to require moving the curb a little bit. I know the city's always been interested in trying to get that there. Mm -hmm. So the green microphone, there you go. Push it, push it. Hello? Push okay, it up. great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering to see if you guys looked at um, using diagonal bike spaces or parking spaces and how much or how many more parking spaces that creates versus parallel parking spaces. So I'm sorry, repeat the first part of that? So how many more par like parking spaces are created by implementing diagonal parking spaces like we see on Main Street in front of Nectar's mm -hmm. um, versus parallel parking spaces? We, we didn't evaluate this simply because of the width that's required then. And so I think early on we kind of maybe prematurely, but I, I think we discounted that just because we're already struggling for width. Uh, so it, it, it may not work. And it typically you get about 10, 15%, maybe more spaces. But. Uh, so I'm from Local Motion. I just want to make, a, I guess, not a comment more than anything, just for context. Um, I've watched this city grow since I was in college, and and you're right that there are, you know, there are some bikers that bike badly in town. I see that too. However, what's happening here is that there are a lot more people trying to get in the road, and it's not just a couple of people. It is families. It is new Americans. It was young families that want to have one car. It's people who can't afford to have a car at all. And wait until e-bikes start showing up, there's gonna be more of that. It's happening everywhere in the country. And so I think it's a really good time to be thinking about how do we use our quarters to the best effect. 
And I think it feels like now or never. I think that we are a city that aspires to attract young families here and young workers and businesses. And to do that, we need to have an infrastructure that works for everybody. And I commend you all, all of you that have been working on this for, for trying to do something that's pretty challenging. But I think there's a solution here. I think that you know, from our perspective, you're pretty close to it. We have um, 80 people in the last week have signed on to a survey petition that, that endorses the um, continuous bike lanes in both uh, from the whole corridor because it's time. As Jason mentioned earlier, it's been sitting around for a long time. Um, they also kind of uh, agree with us that supporting um, the, the priority should be the dangerous areas, which are between Main Street and Pearl Street. That's an area that if any of you walk there or bike there or drive there, um, it doesn't work for any of those modes of transportation. So, so stay at it. But I think it's important that all of us who, who are here living and working, we think about the fact that it's that everybody has to survive in the city at the same time, and we need to find ways to have parking and have bikes and have cars, and we don't have that now in that corridor. So open your minds a little bit to, to creative ways of doing this. And if, to your point about the bad behavior, um, those, those green things that they're showing, the bike lanes, in places where those exist, when you're in a city that has those, people that are on bikes behave much better because they know where they're supposed to be. And when I'm on Winooski Ave, I'm never quite sure because it changes and it changes and I can't see. So, I, I understand. I understand, and and so am I. And so, Do, All right, do well, we? I'm not going to address that, but, yeah. but I think that's a point. I think there's more, um, we can be more on the same page if we're focusing on something that works for everybody. All right. Thank you both. I think we got it. Is does the green microphone, is that around? Yep. Go for it. So um, as somebody that's been living in, and working in Burlington for about 20 years uh, and had lived in the North Winooski corridor and worked downtown for a very long time. Um, you know, I've thought about these, these issues a lot over the years. Um, I think, you know, the comment that Jason uh, from uh, Local Motion made earlier about Winooski Avenue being the scariest place to bike, as a biker, the scary part of North Winooski is downtown. It's not the old North End. It's, it's not north of Pearl. North of Pearl's fine. You can manage on a bike north of Pearl, no problem, just the way it is today. Sure, there are things that could be better, absolutely. But where it gets scary is when you get to Pearl Street and then from Pearl to Maine, where there are no bike lanes, where there's four lanes of vehicles going in both directions, where you have to fend for your life, and it's scary as hell. Um, you know, I'm all in favor of the improvements that are proposed for that section of Winooski Avenue from Pearl to Maine, giving us a road diet, a turn lane down the middle. Frankly, that's going to work better for vehicle circulation than what we have today. What scares me is, is what's being proposed for North Winooski Avenue. Uh, you said in the beginning, multimodal is a key term. Your vision statement captures it all. All modes, all abilities, viable businesses. That's what I saw and what I heard. I see in North Winooski, I see a, a scenario that's really about bikes over everything else. And, and that's what I, I have a problem with. I've also seen a, a uh, sketch of a scenario that what Brian Pine talked about is everybody wins. There's a scenario where we maintain all the parking, we have bike lanes in both directions, and, and we have cars moving in both directions. It's just frankly, excuse my French, fucking expensive and the city can't afford it right now. But let's be honest about that and let's not pretend like there isn't an everybody wins solution. There is. You also talked about uh, we need near and long term options, right? So the near term option is making it better than it is today, but not losing half of the parking. And the long term option is the one we can't afford right now. But let's make that our long term goal. Let's make our near term goal making things better, making things safer, making things work for all modes, but not sacrificing half of the parking. 
we have a business on North Winooski Avenue. Our business doesn't live and die by a local constituency alone. We, we, we live and die in every business on North Winooski Avenue. Every organization on North Winooski Avenue lives and dies by a regional customer base. And a lot of those regional customers are coming by car and there isn't off street parking for those folks. They have to park on the street. We've also developed that density along the North Winooski Avenue corridor. North Winooski Avenue corridor is one of the densest parts of the city. And we've developed that density historically and in recent times. We've encouraged very low off-street parking uh, ratios. We've been able to do that because we have adequate on-street parking to support those tenants and neighbors. Let's not make a mistake, let's not be short-sighted. Let's implement the long-term vision, but let's do some short-term improvements that uh, don't sacrifice parking over bikes. Thank you. The other, uh, <clears throat> we have the green Hello. one again. Is the red one still around? Yeah, right here. The red one, yeah. There you go, the red one next. Um, so you went through when the power went out there on the on the projector, you went through the evaluation criteria, you came to an, uh, some conclusions. There was uh, a whole bunch of things that were considered leading up to that, and it seemed like a pretty good evaluation. I'm curious, what benefit are we gonna get on top of that that will help us make decisions um, when you speak of the parking management plan? And then on top of that, like where does that normally come in? Is, is the parking management plan something that is usually done in this sort of scenario? Or is it, I'm, I'm just curious, if you, you talked about having consultants from New York City, about you work in other places. Is this a normal uh, piece of the process? By and large, if, if, if I understand the question correctly, the parking management plan is traditionally not part of a corridor study. And this follows a traditional planning approach. We have the Regional Planning Commission here, and, and there's, a, there's a federal process that happens on corridor studies. And you typically go through this process, as I articulated just a bit ago, where we were at this now the point of developing alternatives. And we went, we went through an evaluation criteria, and parking loss was one of the criteria, but only one out of several. And this is the result out of that process. If, if there were fewer criteria, or if parking was elevated in, in magnitude, maybe something else would, would, would come out. So this is the where we are today. And we've already identified that the parking management plan is the first step toward a maybe developing an, between an interim today or a, today's condition, which doesn't work for a lot of people, toward maybe an interim condition that is somewhere between here and the near term. The parking management plan is part of that solution. So I think we've already identified and the information that's coming from other studies and, and external experiences Burlington is, is, is difficult. We're a small urban area, and particularly to, to uh, Eric's point there, is that we've developed more densely without some supply of parking. And frankly, where, where some cities uh, have the la la luxury of wide roads and a lot of excess parking, we don't have that here. We're an old city, so we have to think a little bit now about the next steps. And so the parking plan is that next step. So hopefully I've, I've answered you uh, uh, effectively there. So where's the next microphone? Uh, yeah, well, Jason, we, we have 10, 11 more minutes. Yes, show of hands, how many people would like to see bike lanes on the downtown part of Winooski Ave next year? Downtown part of Winooski Ave next year. So that, that's, that's, a quick, that's a quick one. So the, the, green, the green microphone. How many would not want to see that? So we, we, we have a process here, and I want to respect the process. Welcome to Burlington. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've, in my 15 years, I've seen a few things, but this is fine. <laughs> so I, the, the, the process is valuable, so let's follow that. Uh, we have 11 or 10 minutes left, and we'll continue to have this dialogue. Uh, so those with the microphone get the ability to speak. Um, so. Um, my is, is more of a comment. I'm going to suggest anybody who has a car in the city get themselves a dash camera because judging by the atmosphere, I had somebody, I was up here on North Street at the stoplight. The light turned green for me. Some bike went right in front of me. If I had not been quick on the brakes, I would have hit him. And if I had, without my dash cam, good chance I would have been held liable for that. So right. I suggest everybody, 
in this city with a car, get yourself a dash cam to protect yourself because I guarantee you somebody bike on a bike is gonna cut you off and you're gonna be held responsible. All right, do we have the red microphone anywhere? Up in front, there okay. you go, sorry. Um, so that uh, section of South Winooski between, uh, was it King and Maine? Um, in the long-term plan you show having the, uh, the parking between the, um, the bike lane and the travel lane and also cutting it down to one way in the future. Um, I think that's really interesting and pointing on with some other comments about having that in further places or Montreal doing this really well. Um, there's that concern about curb cuts where Montreal does this a lot but they have row homes and not a lot of curb cuts. Uh, but Montreal is a proper city with blocks that are often one way. Was it taken into consideration to have the downtown part of Winooski Ave be one way proper with Union heading north, South Winooski going south, all the way up to where they merge up at the top and making a circulation system natural for that entire corridor so that it would be homogenous all the way through and provide lots of room for uh, more bike infrastructure and probably uh, better spacing and trees and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I will go back if I can, but I'll just verbally go through while I'm flicking through. There were a number of studies that by and large overwhelmingly said that Winooski Avenue should be complete street with travel lanes in both directions. And then there was a study that was done in 2017 that was really traffic based, car based analysis that said if we put one way on Union to, uh, or to, if we made Winooski all of what, just one directional, particularly that downtown section, Union Street would have to be widened and there'd be significant parking impacts on Union. And so that impact was pretty substantial, enough to then recommend that the complete street again, the two way, particularly in the downtown area, the, the Pearl Domain, was really important. And then afterwards, there's been even greater, I think, international awareness. In a lot of cities that have one-way traffic, they're trying to go back to two-way where they need, particularly businesses benefit from two-way traffic. You get that more visibility, you get some more action, you get the streetscape act, act stuff. When it's just residential, you don't see as so much benefit of the one-way versus two-way. So. And there's, so those studies are all available on the internet and particularly on this project website is the 2017 study, I think has a link to that one, which is the traffic study. Great, thank you. Yep, green microphone. Hi there. Uh, it's nice to see uh, city councilors here, landlords, tenants, business owners and everything. And this is a pretty simple question. What is this, this I haven't heard anything about the cost of this project. The director of public works is here right now. So what is this costing for the study and what is the north, downtown, and south ones are gonna cost? Yeah. We haven't seen anything about any money here. I mean, we're spending money on this, for sure. And you know, we've got a 90 million or $120 million renovation at BHS right now, you know? So who's gonna pay for this? Are we getting federal funds, tax, taxpayers? Are we getting state funds? What's going on with that? So, I mean, I should get an answer on what this is costing. I, unfortunately, I don't have that answer right now because and this, this option does not move the curb at all and therefore it's, uh, directors. So the study itself is around $160,000. It's an 80-20 match. The uh, federal funds are 80% and we're paying 20%. So that is for the study itself. The cost of the recommendations here, uh, they, they are in the near term recommendations are lower because we do not need to move curb. We do need to do additional work to develop conceptual estimates on, on the near term. Thank and you. Then, and then Thank let you. alone parking management plan and some other costs. So that's where the next phase will go into that next uh, depth. Uh, where's the red one <coughs> back there? Hi. <clears throat> well, um, given the city's climate emergency declaration this fall, I appreciate the support given in this plan to less greenhouse gas intensive modes of transport. Um, that said, I was looking at some of the renderings and it seemed like there were some parts that had more trees and some parts that had less. And I'm wondering what the sort of thinking was around the amount of trees that will be planted in, in the different sections. Thanks. So uh, that's my fault on the rendering side, is that we do have an exact count of the number of trees in this corridor. The rendering does not ad ad accurately reflect the street tree number. 
So that's the caveat. But in terms of the uh, metrics, we know exactly how much curb uh, and green strip might be affected by each of those options that we evaluated. Uh, so sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, I own uh, two buildings on North Winooski Avenue, and a bus uh, one of them's in my business. Um, we need parking, obviously, for people uh, to, to shop. Um, but there, I just noticed, uh, by the way, I love bicycles, too. And I really encourage bike lanes and no poo-pooing bicyclists. And the bicyclists, you know, we're all working together on the streets, right? And we need lots of bike lanes. But I sit out there at 5 and 6 o'clock, there's traffic, a little bit of traffic on the street. 7, 8 o'clock, go into it. Not a peep on that street. Sometimes after 9 o'clock, I can stand out in front of my, my yard in front of foe. And there won't be a car that comes until, you know, maybe 10 cars until, you know, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning when they start to flow again. There's not a lot of flow. I don't know. I'm sure you're doing the studies on this. But it seems like we need bikes, we, but, but cars, more, more cars, unless you build it, they will come. It's a philosophy. There's only moments when, when, that, when there needs to be that, many, that much flow for cars on that street. I'm a business, and I, you'd think I'd want it as well. But on, on the other side of the street, near Pearl Street, and I wanted to speak for Lee, who owns the Radio Bean, and, and folks that own Shalimar and stuff, they essential parking for their business down there. The people need to stop and go in there. And then if you start taking away their sidewalk, you know, dining facilities and, and um, areas on the sidewalk that they are, that's the, the most vital part of their business. You're going to kill those businesses right there in the corner from the Shalimar down the Radio Bean all the way down to the corner. And so uh, those are things that definitely need to be thought about. Keep the bike lanes going though, for sure. Don't worry about the cars. The cars are fine. Hi, uh, I'm just curious uh, again about the move to go two-way because it seems like if we didn't go two-way on those portions, we could have bike lanes and the parking. And I, it seems like, you know, there's a, with the idea that Councillor Pine said of having your cake and eating it too, I, you know, I just haven't heard about the conductivity problem. Like, I, it, I've never heard anyone raise it. I'm a pretty involved community member. I work on North Winooski Avenue. I've worked there for 25 years. I walk sometimes, I drive sometimes, I bike sometimes. Parking matters and biking matters, but I don't know if anyone cares about conductivity. So I will say that the transit benefits helped that option improve because GMT have specifically avoided much of Winooski Avenue for years because of its limited connectivity in two directions. And if we talk about accessibility and mobility for people who have different uh, criteria or different ways in which they're traveling, the improvements for transit was part of that process that I think elevated that two-way vehicle option. If the comments are coming back and saying, look, we don't want that, I think th there's no foregone conclusion that these options are what's going to happen. This is a planning study. And if the comments from everybody is saying, in that section, let's retreat from what's being proposed there, I think that's, that's why we're here tonight. Hello. Hi. I am scared. I am scared of biking on Wanuski Ave because cyclists have largely been ignored by urban planners for years. For years have only cared about cars and are now finally starting to care about bikes. And I'm scared biking on Wanuski Ave. I cannot safely bike there. And I'm scared of climate change. This is a serious issue. The city acknowledges it. I'm sure all the people in this room acknowledge that this is a chief problem and that we need to do something about that. We cannot sit idly by and not do anything about it. That will not change anything. These bike lanes are a huge part of creating a safe cycling infrastructure and getting people out of cars, which is important for climate change and to stop the climate epidemic happening. Thank you. So it, it's uh, 6.30 by my watch and the clock behind me. Do we want to, we, we, we agreed until this time. Uh, President, do you think we've done our due <laughs> diligence? Uh, um, I, 
All right, so uh, I would welcome all of you to please stick around. The project team will be manning the tables here. We have the 3D visual on the iPad that I'll boot up again. Please, your comments matter. And I really appreciate all the, all the spoken comments today. It's been really uh, helpful for me to understand where people are on this corridor. And we have still some food to eat. And we're around for another half an hour in this space. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.